Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valero Liwopend. Today we're going to be talking about probably the most exciting draw that um, I've seen. I mean, it's interesting to talk about draws because a lot of people think that draws are just a lame result. And yet, you got to know that if both players play equally well or equally bad, actually, you know, the game is going to be a draw. But increasing the chances for a win and essentially posing problems to the opponents so you can make him or force him to keep the equality is probably one of the more ex most exciting parts of any game. So I would like to share my view on that and give you some good feedback on what you could use in your own games through this one. So this was played between Piotr Fiddler and Alexander Morozovic, two incredibly powerful grandmasters. And the game started, their game started with knight f3, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and d5. d6, d5 is an interesting approach on how black tries to stop the English opening. And he does it by actually not allowing white to play e4 or g3 because any similar moves like d3, e4, and whatever will be uh, immediately countered as black actually plays with the move of pawn up to d4. So it's a very important thing. Now what black, what white chooses to do now is to play d4 going into the queen's gambit. Pretty standard, black plays bishop to the e7. And then as this happens, as we said, ultimately black decides to do uh, bishop, okay, bishop f4 and a3. Uh, would I say that white's approach is very much the best one? I don't think a3 is that much of a great move, even though bishop f4 quite, you know, it looks quite good. It's closer to the center, it seems helpful. So after a3, black plays b6. So we're still setting up in this position. Everything is about this setup. It's about you know, really making sure that we have the, the possibility to uh, really get our pieces right and set them in proper positions. So step by step. Okay, so let's take a look. After that move, then black plate, then white plate with a move. C to the D in this position uh, and black plays pawn takes to D, knight X to the D5. This is very important. So what do we find now? Structure is changing. It is a little early, which means that it could be a bit risky in this case. However, in some way, black field is much less developed and having much less space as opposed to white. So things actually work out well for white. What comes out next? The move of knight x to the d5. Basically, white plays knight x to the d5. And then black does e to the d5. So exchange takes queen c2. Now let's answer one very key question. When are you allowed to change the structure or open up the structure early on in the opening before you get to the middle game? That is a very fair question. And I believe the answer to that question lies within the amount of preparation you've set in comparison to the opponent, not so much how well prepared you think you are, but rather how actually you feel you are prepared as opposed to him. Like if your opponent's very much behind and you, you're like not perfectly developed, it doesn't matter that you're not perfectly developed. You're better developed than him. So comparing your pieces to the opponent's is the only way to know if you have a more or less in order to uh, begin an attack. So let's take a look and see what happened next. After that move, essentially it was black who played with the uh, pawn up to the c5. And then white does b to the c, b to the c, and e4. And this is really interesting in this type of position. What is going on now is why chooses to open dramatically. And that's a pretty big thing to do. I'm gonna say that. Pretty big thing, pretty big deal. But he wants to do it. Why? Because we're better prepared. 
white has three pieces developed while black has only two and i wouldn't consider real rook to be really that well developed it is his bishop that just feels a little locked down and not in a not in a wonderful position i have to say the way it is so this gives white a very good chance to start advancing with the move e4 we are opening up our own pieces and getting ready to do a lot more so this doesn't look bad okay Black plays d takes to the e, queen takes to the e4. Again, remember that part. The only way for you to evaluate preparation, development, and strength depends on the comparison between your pieces and the ones that your opponent is having to oppose you. It's the most realistic and the most essential way on how you can come down to that, that conclusion. So what's going on next? I mean, obviously that's not supposed to be so bad. Um, of course, right after queen takes d4, black actually played this move. And that looks a little risky because indeed, it feels like black is going to challenge us pretty big with that move of uh, bishop to b4 and everything. So it's a tricky thing. It's a really big deal. So what does white do? Bishop d3. We know that white is more prepared than black, so we don't fear about any of the different tactics out there. We just take this so that we have everything under control, and everything is under control, as you can see at this point. Very good, very well played. So bishop to the d3, bishop f6, and knight e5. It is just enough to see those four pieces, each of which is wonderfully situated to attack black. The bishop and the queen attacking the h7, the queen of white attacking the a8 rook. The fact that almost all of the black pieces are on the back rank makes it possible to choose an incredibly crazy move in a way with knight e5, just so we could get ready and attack or exploit his backside pieces. I have to say that I'm very happy to tell you this, Despite all the craziness, the madness even, of why just pushing through and opening up with you know seemingly no preparation, it works. It does get to work because we're better. Now what happens? Black plays knight c6. And this is where the real heavy tactics actually take place. It's, it all starts to fall apart moment black does this kind of move but uh, let's see why and what happened so actually after that move um then why does go to play with the move of queen takes h7 surely not this move given that black will have moves like bishop takes c5 threatening us you know if we take a8 f4 king and d3 is going to hang so white decided to try and be on top and definitely set up set out to make some more serious threats versus the black position so it actually makes a good good sense here so uh, this is very very important now what is happening at that point is that okay so after this capture uh, surely black has to do the move of king to the f8 as, as he stands and uh, okay so what goes on next after this move <clears throat> After that is played, white, of course, plays king to the h8, queen to h8. And uh, so, it's pretty interesting. After the move of queen to h8, we basically just get to continue with more threats. We don't care about anything else. We just want to think about more challenges that we could come forward with. It's like white almost takes the initiative with the idea to grow it and continue with this, um, like in the longer run. Let's see. After that, of course, um, king e8, then white plays with knight x to c6. And so it's a great thing. So just knight x to c6, king d7, bishop b5. Wow, that's a crazy move. I got to tell you, it's it's really crazy when you think about this. You know, white is just blocking, allowing black to kind of attack the queen and take it even. But we don't care. Because despite the craziness, 
It's those few pieces that when they co coordinate, when they support each other, they can make an incredible amount of tactics and challenges and set incredible amount of challenges against the opponent. And that's what really makes it good. After the move of bishop to the e5, black definitely has many issues to worry about. A lot of them have to do with the, the backside pieces. When a piece is on the backside, it has a very small relative value. That means we, it really doesn't matter. Of course, there's always the potential that you might get it open and better, but that's in the future. And things could develop a lot faster, a lot easier. So actually after that move, then uh, let's see what happened. Here, black played king next to the c6 and long side castles. And I do love this completely because this is a perfect, a brilliant way on how uh, every important piece of white sort of gets involved, ready to challenge and attack black and keep him up, keep him down. It's so beautiful. So what about black? I mean, can he do anything? Can he try anything? Of course he can, it's, but it's just very difficult. Just almost impossible. So, next, black play bishop takes to the e5. Made sense. Of course, you could see why he wouldn't take the queen. I mean, if black did take the queen, as well as on the previous move, if he did take the queen, that would have probably taken in the e8. And then we see that as a result of all these complications, there is just a lot of uh, terror actually coming in, in this case. There's the attack, and um, yes, so. That's why Black couldn't take the queen right now, and later he also couldn't take it because after the you know after the move of king takes the c6, of course taking the knight that attacks the queen and alongside castles, if Black does take the queen, there's going to be bishop to the e4 check, you know checking against Black and um, it's pretty powerful. And then for instance, after Black plays say knight to king to the b5, he could take, and then there is this taking 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 he will lose a lot of material and uh, you know the position is going to be a complete disaster so you can see why uh, you know i quite love that <clears throat> in many accounts it shows the power of the good pieces of the, the dangerous pieces and um, you know, there was not too much that black could do about this really it's very interesting Okay, let's go back, going back to, to the earlier situation. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay, so what we're, what we're seeing is that Black did not do it this way. He actually played with the move of King takes to the C6, long side castles, and Bishop takes to the E5. Just a very standard, very good-looking move. And yet... In some way, you can understand why I would say that this position is almost um, very difficult for black because white threatens every move is with a threat. That's the initiative. Bishop e4, king c7, rook takes d8, rook takes h8, rook takes h8. In exchange up, it almost feels like the game is over. I mean, we should we should resign, right? Looks like it. But uh, see. First and foremost, first and foremost, remember that winning material is a good thing, yet it changes the position. It changes, it shifts the nature, and sometimes we actually lose quite a bit of the initiative. He plays the move bishop f4 check, and now since white won, won the material but he lost the initiative, black does have bishop b7 attacking both the rook on h8 and the bishop on e4, with the king, and it's just kind of amazing if you think about this, step by step, pretty powerful. And then what's happening in this case? Then obviously if we play with the move of bishop takes b7, rook takes h8, we cannot take a8 due to bishop takes c4. So white won the material, he transformed his advantage into a clear material, but he lost the initiative. It's something important for you to know that even in the most difficult positions, even in the situations where you make a mistake, you could still get that little window where you could fight for the initiative if you can just create some more threats against your opponent. And that's what we're doing with the move of bishop to the b7 in this moment. 
Black is actually taking over the initiative. Takes, capture, obviously white's a pawn up, still, but it's opposite colored bishops, so uh, there's not too much that white can do to win. And uh, this is very interesting. So it's the game sort of shifts a couple of times. We see the shift of initiative. We see the shift of pressure. And um, you know, like let, let's take a look. After rook takes h, white played bishop d5, rook d8, rook d1, taking, capture, rook f8, and then black takes the f2. The activity of white is not much better. And now black is equalizing the material. And um, yes, so this is pretty good. Um, rook takes f2, then rook to d2, rook takes d, king takes to the d2, and uh, so uh, ultimately after that, black plays bishop to the e5, b3, and um, bishop f6, strong. So, what I want to tell you about this game are three very, very key points. Something that you could really take and try to incorporate in your own games. Okay. The first one being very valuable thing. Just don't forget that. We go back to the beginning. We go back to the very start. And we see that the game started pretty interestingly. And white obviously got a lot more preparation than black. He even wanted to use that preparation by opening up. And yet. You have to know that there are two sides to any strategy. Unless you have naturally built up a position that is superior in both you know, peace coordination and natural development, you're not going to feel 100% prepared. The fact that white is better prepared than black gives him the opportunity of e4, but does not bring him the advantage. This is why I put so much emphasis on the buildup, because it is the buildup that creates the practical punch. If you do not have the buildup, whatever concrete circumstances you may have in the position, they're likely not going to matter as much. The buildup is what creates the opportunity for a breakthrough or opening that feels natural, well prepared, and doesn't depend so much on, you know, is everything perfect? It's a very, very valuable idea. So, step by step, you have to set it, you know, set things together. Now, White obviously relied on the fact that he was much more prepared with with the bishop, but it was still too early. The king was in the middle. It wasn't fully developed. It wasn't fully prepared. And despite the temporary success, because the structure was missing, because there wasn't a whole lot of backup, there were loose ends that Black was able to exploit, and in the end of the variation take a great advantage of, you see. And that's another interesting thing that I want to tell you. Sometimes you're going to get in a position that just feels bad. And you're going to ask yourself, I feel like this was not, this is not supposed to be that bad. But I don't know why it looks bad. You know, I, I don't know how to handle this pressure. Now, my dad gave me a huge advice. He told me, think about it. Did you do anything wrong? to end up in a position that looks so bad. Now, if you didn't, then probably it is not as bad as you may think. And that was such a powerful revelation for me because I realized however bad the position is, if I haven't made any major mistake I can remember of, maybe I just think this is a bad position. But in fact, I could be having this powerful resource that I'm just not seeing yet. So all I have to do is to dig deeper, dig deeper and dig deeper. And the more challenging it gets, the more interesting it happens to be. And that helped me in so many games because right now, whenever I get in a position that I don't know what to do, I basically ask myself, what do I have? What are my resources? How can I try to counter against him? This is very important. And when I do that, I keep looking and analyzing in this situation. So it's very, very uh, in important. Um, right now, white wasn't perfectly prepared and black, you know, unless you actually get impatient or you basically just give up on the game thinking that you played terribly, you could find it. You see, 
in the end of the line where everything felt so terrible, it turns out that actually black has this hidden resource due to white's bad development and the king and everything else. So, uh, you know, this is this is quite interesting. So um, I got to tell you, it was um, a beautiful game in terms of evaluating the different you know possibilities. And remember that there is no perfect position. Every position has some sort of a problem. Alakine said that. So no matter whether you're from the attacking perspective or from the defending perspective, you want to ask, what is the resource I have? If you can't see it, sit there. Think and keep analyzing. Sooner or later, you will find out a resource. You will find out and, uh, uh, you know, just what you can do. I want to show you a couple other examples that are just as instructive, in my opinion. And um, one of them, again, from, from a Grandmaster game, from Grandmaster perspective, actually. Um, it's, by, it's by Richard Rappert. Richard Rappert is one of the youngest and yet most powerful Grandmasters. So you played a game versus Grandmaster Alexander Norman. I want to share with you. In fact, I do want to say that for for those of you who want me to send you this game uh, as any you know, the annotation or something, just um, feel free to message me on uh, on my site, which is actually um, tigerlewolf.com. So you could just send me a message there. I'd be glad to send you this game and answer any questions you may be having. Or just, you know, send me an email to valeri.liloff at gmail.com. So that would be quite good. Just send it over. Now, uh, also don't forget that this webinar comes with a great offer of uh, you know 60% I think it's 60% discount that comes to a pretty powerful uh, training package has a lot of um, you know it's called the secrets of modern masterpieces that is by grandmaster top grandmaster uh, Sabo Ballo he's almost 2700 and I'm going to post a link on the chat so you could check it out has a lot of these little things that will help you to be better at practical chess so I just uh, put in a link, and I'm also just going to um, set up a link below the video so you can check the link below the video. Um, it's for the super package by Grandmaster uh, Grandmaster Saba. So, um, okay, one second. All right, here we go. I'm going to put it there so you could any of you could actually see it and. Uh, Follow it through. So let's take a look at this game that was played between not Swiddler. Seen that one. Noman versus Rappert. Noman and Rappert. Here. There we go. So what this game was about was basically White starting with the King's Indian Count of Fianchetto variation. A rather quiet. But pretty nice opening. Essentially, this helped him to develop the bishop. Castles, knight c3, h3 is done, so g4 can be taken under under our control. So things don't actually look so bad. Now, what happened next is very interesting. So after the move of h3, bishop f5, white played d5. And very similar to the previous game, you see white beginning, white starting with the attack quite quickly. So this is quite interesting. After that move, d5, obviously white doesn't risk anything. He doesn't have his king in the middle of the board as he had in the previous game. And uh, actually after that move, then black played knight a5, white does knight d2. So he's definitely looking forward to getting more space and the opportunity to advance with e4. So what happens here, the knight d2? Knight d2, c5, e4, bishop d7. First of all, you have to learn to evaluate a position based on the structure. In some tactical positions, you would, of course, care about threats and everything else. But you really want to know that structure will often determine 95% of what this position is going to be. 
So right now we realize that black is a little less active. But as you can see, because of the structure of the white pieces, not just the pawns, but the pieces, white can't begin an attack, just not yet in this position. So this is very interesting. Um, then after that move, white plays queen c2, a6, and b3. A powerful pawn chain, which uh, actually sets everything in, in motion. Black played b5 and rook b1 to move it out of the way. So, after rook b1, what happened? Okay, rook b1, black does knight to the h5. What I gotta say in this case is that we have probably the first key position, and I wanna talk a little bit about a key position or a critical position. What is a key position? What is a critical position? The number one thing about a critical position is one that is likely going to change the way we go for, from this point on. Very valuable question. How does white start his middle game right now? Does he start it with an attack or a breakthrough? Does he go about this slowly? It's a key point. So we want to figure it out correctly. So it's very interesting how to do it. Now, obviously, we want to think about a couple of things that will make you know the critical position worthwhile and just good to play. First thing, decide on what is your goal in the key position. What do you want to do right now? You might also want to think about what you would like to do eventually. You know, what would you suspect it will change into? But most importantly, it matters right now. So what do we have right now? See, so very interesting. Number one, you know, like, why it needs to finish up the development. And eventually, I'd say the future goal, the long-term goal, is going to be to begin an attack due to his space. You so said, well, we have two goals. Now, you don't want to have too many, but we want to have two. S specific goal, current goal, in this case. And more importantly, long-term goal something that you would like to strive to achieve as you go along further. And uh, that's a big idea. Now White's major goal is eventually going to be to find a way to develop and eventually transform it into an attack. So how do we do that? That's the second question. So first, think about a critical position, figure out the goal. Second question, figure out an outline. An outline often means a sequence or a setup. How would you like to develop your pieces or what do you want to do with them um, in the next few moves? You don't have to be a perfect development or a perfect outline. It could be a rough one, but I'd like to consider that it is often similar to a to-do list. You know, so this is very interesting. A to-do list of moves and ideas that will eventually help us out with our play. So what to do next? Now, white started off with bishop b2. The simple approach is always the better. Remember, begin with simple moves that help you to harmonize the pieces and uh, actually get everything ready. We have that opportunity step by step. Now, with the bishop on b2, we connect the rooks and we sort of complete the development almost. So uh, let's take a look. After that was played, basically... Black continued with e5. It kind of changes the structure again, but it doesn't shift too much White's plans. White just wants to maneuver. How many times have you heard about that concept of maneuvering? You know what maneuvering is? Maneuvering is simply repositioning your pieces on better squares. And by better, I mean more capable positions. Step by step, you want to make sure that your pieces have more meaning. Better connection between one another, between one another, and now White's able to do that quite nicely. He has the possibility to think of a move like f4 in this case, and uh, see. So this is really interesting. After that move, Black plays f5. So when I ask you guys, what do you think about this position? It's a very important moment. So uh, what should be White's best approach right now? Take a moment and tell me what do you think.
what should be Wyatt's best continuation over here right now? Tricky question. Hmm. Now, all you're thinking, I'd like to answer some questions that I actually did not get to see on the chat. So, um, okay. Um, all right, I'm very interested in the mechanism and principle how to play. Okay, like, tell me about what you're actually talking about. I want to know how the principle of super grandmaster syncing work, uh, but how do they make it on Blitz? Well, there are two things. First of all, grandmasters recognize patterns very quickly. So we can't do it as they do. But the other thing is that they have the habit of playing simple. And you will find it very strange, but most chess players tend to overcalculate. And instead of actually taking things logically and simpler, they overcomplicate things. So one good exercise for you could be to try and make things as simple as possible. That's what you want to do. And this is especially going to help you in Blitz because that wouldn't require a whole lot of calculations. What about an unknown opening or a regular, irregular opening? Well, just develop your pieces nicely. You know, the principles of getting the pieces closer to the center, bringing them, fat, bring, bring them fast. You can come up with your own structure, even if you don't know it necessarily. Just remember that. Okay, so let's see again. What can we do in this position? Whose black's bishop is better uh, on the board? I would say that both of them don't look pretty. But um, I think that it's really up to White to decide on what decision he'd like to make. So what would you guys think? <laughs> good question. Very good. Anyone? Take your time. Just think carefully. <clears throat> G4 or F4. Well, G4 doesn't work because Blood's got two attackers versus this square while we only have one defender. F4 is possible. And that's exactly what White did in the game. Gotta open. Remember from the previous game, we have to think about the possibility to, so like, uh, open up the position. And then we've got to be thinking of the way to, you know, really give our pieces a chance to, you know, advance. So now this is how it, wor how it works. So, um, okay, let's see uh, what happens next. Then after that move... Um, Black plays with B to the C, B to the C, Rook takes B2. And this was a pretty big move that Black chose in this position. Um, you know, trying to basically uh, break and open up and do whatever. And so um, this is uh, just quite nice. I mean, after, after that move, basically, Black White plays Rook takes the B2. After the move of Rook takes the B2, he is trying to go through with the move of EXF and open up. So... Was that right? Yes and no. You see, it was right because Black was justified to think that this rule just works. But a lot of the very simple buildup that White created sort of shoulders him from this. And you have to understand that the simpler buildup that you do does not bring you any immediate benefit. But in the longer run, what it will do is that it will help you because if the preparation comes out, you know, and your opponent still tries to break open and do things like this, uh, you know, you will have the natural, what I would call the real command, the real set of pieces and, and tools so we can confront them. And it was a, it's a really interesting thing to do. After that move, basically Black picked up to do the move of uh, Edixf, Gdixf, and then the next candidate is, of course, Bishop takes F takes to the E4, Knight takes to the E. See, we're not afraid in this type of position. No, we're not worried. Let's just keep it up. Have the opportunity to, you know, like set our own forces together and move them up. And uh, it's all good at the moment. Step by step, things look excellent. 
All right, so actually after that line, then basically black plate with queen to the h4. Very important move. Hoping to set his own uh, queen over there and, you know, and line it up to the attack. Wasn't a bad idea. But again, real threats are missing. And, you know, I always say it, uh, you know, the most important thing for, an a for any attack to work is the chance for real threats to occur. If real threats cannot happen, then uh, we don't have to worry. This is a pretty important thing. Okay, white plays rook to the b1 in this position. And then after the move of rook to b1, essentially it was black, you know, who's in a bit of a trouble, doesn't have the chance to move or do anything with the queen. And, uh, okay, black played bishop takes to the h3, but doesn't matter because white's going to play with the move of, uh, uh, okay, so after the capture, Bishop takes h, queen takes h, rook f2. See, there is this natural activity. Everything feels good because white's got quite a bit of that, you know, like command between, between his pieces. And that matters a lot. Step by step, everything works. And uh, so that, let's see. Okay, so right now, after that type of position, of course, should black just jump in to attack with queen g4, it doesn't matter. And uh, so, yeah, it's perfect. Still, black is not bad, because it looks like he's got a little bit of a momentum, but white's preparation is holding black down. That's a really powerful thing to do. And, uh, okay, let's see. After that move, obviously black decided to play queen e3, Intended pin to make sure that we, you know, kind of stops different tactics from happening it was a nice move, but didn't matter too much because there's not a real threat. My place king g2. It's interesting. See, we do it all without almost any calculation. It's all about, you know, gradual step by step preparatory moves to make things work. And we have rook to f3, black queen cannot go anywhere out. So he has to play with the move of knight x to the c4. And then after knight x to the c, knight takes d6. Rook takes f4, knight takes f capture. Rook takes f4 and knight x to the c. So in the end, white, it's, it almost looks like white is winning quite easily. Wow, it's perfect. Somebody will actually look at this position and will say, all right, I love this. So, white was very successful, right? This is obviously great. Don't hurry so much. Always say, don't hurry. Don't over-calculate, but don't hurry. Anyone has possibilities. So it's really based on one thing. So what is the ultimate question you got to ask yourself when you find yourself in such a position? It's about who's got more activity. The activity matters most, actually. And, uh, you know, right now, that's the main problem. You see, it's like the black activity, but just um, it's not that good. So he played with the move of queen g4, queen h4, queen g4 again, queen h4 one more, check. But um, I can just really go back and, uh, and stabilize. So there isn't a whole lot that black could do in this position. Very powerful, very interesting. So um, actually, it was an amazing game that shows the power of both sides and essentially the fact that white didn't make any mistake he was trying to get an advantage it was obviously a little rushed the way he actually opened up with f4 but it's also interesting to see that when black tried to counter it white's development and preparation gave him that uh you know flexibility that beautiful control that in the end of the day just feels so effective it was great it was really well played and really nicely done in this case so um, this is quite nice so um you know just remember step by step take the time you know prepare yourself bring everything together and then you can even open up or do whatever you want I love that game, by the way, and it shows that there is a lot of depth that comes with these positions, and it's not necessarily connected with calculations, but more about evaluation, evaluating the different special circumstances, weaknesses, or vulnerabilities. Pretty complex stuff, but that's what makes it fascinating, at least in my opinion.
Now, once again, a lot of that stuff is explained in a really easy language by Grandmaster uh, Saba himself. So I want to I want to recommend you to take a look at the course right beneath this video. You're going to find a lot of um, you know interesting uh, concepts uh, in that one for an incredible discounted price, only for a few hours. You can check the link below this video, or you could just um, go to the link I will send you on the chat. So keep in mind, many of the techniques and strategies are presented in a brilliant way by the Grandmaster. So you'll be excited to have a look at them. Now let's see another interesting game I want to show you. This time it was played by Kasparov himself, Gary Kasparov, one of the greatest players who ever, ever lived. And um, I'm going to open it up now. And here we go. By the way, once again, if you do want me to send you the annotated file with those games that I was just looking at, do not forget to just send me a little email, and I'll be more than happy to do so. My email is valeri.lilov at gmail.com, or my site is tigerlilov.com. Just send me a message. I'll send you all the different annotations, and um, I hope that you're able to use them in order to further improve your chess. Here we go. Kasparov's game comes right now. So Kasparov actually was playing why this was a game played in 2015. So this was after Kasparov really retired. But then he played many different matches and games, actually friendly matches as we call them. So they were quite interesting. So let's see what happened in this game. Now, after the moves of um, d4, e6, knight f3, c4, White continued with knight bd2, a3, and queen next to the d2. Exchange recapture and e3. So I would just worked out quite fine, I have to say. All of this was uh, good. And so what happened in the game? After the move of pawn to e3, in this position, black picked up the dude d5. Okay, so what do we do now? So first and foremost, you want to learn how to evaluate. Now, I mentioned something about critical positions, which I suppose, I hope, that it was useful to you. But truth is, evaluation is a lot deeper than that, and we've just scratched the surface. Now, the key thing that you want to ask yourself every time when you evaluate the position is really begin with the question, what's the positional character? There's, there are really two major characters. We got a tactical position, which we know often as dynamic, and simple, a position that is not going to be shaken too much, and we call it static. Now, the reason why you want to be aware of both of these is because depending on what character the position takes, what shape it takes, we'll care about, two, about, about different things. For example, if we do have a more of a static character, we would care a lot more about long-term advantages, you know, long-term maneuvering, slow plan of improving the pieces, all those type of things. And they're nice. They're important. And yet, if we have a kind of situation which is going to be a lot more tactical, a lot more open, and things are really not going to stay the same, well, then we care a lot more about short-term prospects and ideas. You know, this is how we'd like to do it very importantly. So in that specific situation, what we've got is the kind of position in which we have a dynamic situation. Not because it's super sharp, but rather because this is going to be a position that will change the structure uh, actually a little bit more. So that's a very valuable idea. Just remember that thing. The secret of evaluation comes from the question of assessing very specifically if it is, uh, you know, rather static or a rather dynamic type of position. So it's it's very, very important. So what we have is a much more of a, you know, right now, of course, we have c to the d5, queen x to the d5, 
and then knight b5, which really challenges the queen. We've got knight c7 as an opportunity of a threat. And as black goes back, bounces down with the queen, white plays f3, taking away the e4. a6, knight c3, e5, e4. Position is good. Everything is stable. And this is one of my major advices to you, like just major piece of advice that I want to give you is make sure you don't treat critical positions or sharp positions too tactically. Because the, the more tactically you treat it, the bigger the risk is for you to mess up a mistake so or, or make a mistake. Just so take it slow. Think about that. Step by step, let's just improve and get everything right. So after that move, obviously what black decided to do in this case was knight d7, and white plays queen f2. He just continues. He doesn't worry about tactics or variations or whatever it is in this position. Uh, you know, let's just get the pieces right and make them perfect. So now things look good. What's coming up after this? Well, black played with the move of knight of the c7. I just, no, sorry, knight of the c5. And then a white plays with bishop to the e3. It's a beautiful move. It's I love that move also for the fact that now white is ready to go ahead with moves like, say, uh, now we could go ahead with moves like bishop to you know, rook to the d1 and others. And uh, it's pretty relevant to do. Um, so let's take a look. Black played knight b3. And then after that, white continues with this move. Step by step. It's all we really want in this kind of position. Put your pieces together, get them close, and let your opponent try to push the position. The one who starts first would usually be the one, you know, who makes a mistake, who basically just, uh, you know, makes makes the blunder. See, it's a big idea right now. White gets the pieces, he sets, he sets the rook into play, and he's got everything right. And what happens next is just as interesting. Let's see it. Black played bishop to the e6, and next move, white plays bishop e2. D8 castles. Even though black did not weaken the position, it's so much easier to add there. And uh, now black does knight to the e8. And then, of course, white plays queen to the g3. So, quite interesting. We have an opportunity to play f4. We get a chance to actually try to, do, try to open up the position. Just let's take it easy. So, in g3, f6. But what do you do when you get yourself in the middle game? Like when you have most of your pieces developed or already set up. So what do you do? Do you attack? Do you open? Do you like regroup or improve gradually? So I think the most important thing that you've got to do in this case is first and foremost take the opportunity to make the build up. See, that is what we really have to do. This is great. What did Kasparov do in this position, realizing that he has he has quite a bit of a buildup? He opens. After the buildup, it's always the opening. And so actually after the f4 and then bishop to the h5, then uh, white black plays bishop c4. See, both sides use their current development to challenge the opponent. And now the complications start. But take care about one thing. Nobody has a superior preparation than the opponent. Okay, so this is very important. After that move of rook takes to the f1, we've got f6 under pressure. And uh, so essentially black plays king h8, knight d5. White seems to get a lot of activity, but that's due to the sacrifice that he made. He sacrifices material just so that you can get the, uh, you know, the, the, the active pieces. It's it's a bit of an, an almost a little unnatural. It works. Take a look. After that move, Black plays rook takes d5. Very powerful counter strike. 
you know, the knight on d5 basically holds everything great for white. So the moment black really takes it down is a perfect time where, where basically white loses his uh, beautiful control and he could no longer continue with an, with an attack that's as strong. It's really interesting. So you see, because black didn't do anything wrong, because black did not make any weaknesses, he was in a perfect condition to fight back. Usually the problem of where somebody gets a disadvantage in the position happens because that player, that exact player, loses the initiative, he creates a weakness, or he loses the balance out there. So, like, uh, you know, actually this is a very interesting idea. So, like, after that move of um, queen f2, that's what white did. Um, and let's see what happened. It's pretty interesting. Next move, black played f takes to d, and then queen f8 check. Here, queen e7. Almost looks wonderful, and yet it's not enough. So white makes another sacrifice so that he could avoid the retreat. He wanted to avoid the retreat at any cost, so let's just take down the, let's take down the rook, uh, the, the knight with the, with the rook. Pretty interesting. Not big, though. Takes. Bishop h6, knight f5, check, knight g7. So um, it's it's fairly uh, you know simple for black. He just defends quite quickly, and uh, you know it's really easy. Queen takes d5, rook c8, bishop f3, and queen f7. That's so good. See now it turns out it almost white's initiative actually kind of fades away. So, but but then the good thing is that we don't have the g7 under any serious pressure, and um, see so. And actually, that's the key, step by step, very interestingly. And then apparently after that move, h3, b5, bishop e4 here, uh, this one, and queen e7. Black just keeps it up. He moved up to it to challenge the white queen, and uh, you know there were a couple of different checks. So in the end, white finishes with the with perpetual. But it is a brilliantly balanced game. And that's the key thing. Keep the balance. If you can keep the balance for a little longer, if you can keep developing, if you can keep the right stages of development, you always have the potential to fight back, whether it's in the attack or the defense. In any case, I do hope that uh, uh, you find this useful. I'm going to discuss the principles of Nimzovich in another webinar. I've already discussed it, actually, um, you know, in a previous webinar. But feel free to check my site if you want to see some of the previous webinars. And also, do not forget to check the brilliant uh, training package by Grandmaster Saba. He's uh, in the top players of the world, brilliant player. So you might actually find it very helpful to see his training package. And uh, I'm just posting a link on the chat. And also, you could take a look at the, at the link below the video. I want to thank you all for tonight. And I'll speak to you next weekend.